Okay. <laughs> and without further ado, you can take it away, Stephen. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> well, thank you, everybody, for coming tonight and uh, listening to me ramble on about seaweed. Uh, hopefully, everyone will uh, get some new information out of this. And uh, as Christine said, if we could uh, hold the, the questions for the end, uh, I'll try to get through this pretty quickly and leave uh, plenty of time for, for questions. So um, with that, let me share my screen. Everybody see that? Yep, I see All it. Right. No, it tells me that that everyone can see it now. Okay. Uh, so, uh, as Christine said, I'm the Marine Botany Habitat Restoration Specialist for Cornell Cooperative Extension. I've worked for Extension for uh, 22 years. Uh, my background is in um, marine plants, specifically seaweeds, but also seagrasses uh, and coastal plants, uh, salt marsh, um, and uh, beaches. So. Uh, that's the work I do for, for Cornell. Um, most of the seaweed work I've done for most of my career has been mostly dealing with nuisance algae blooms and identifying stuff that people find while they're uh, beachcombing and want to know what it is. Um, so uh, the, the advent of seaweed aquaculture on Long Island's definitely put a a different twist in in my work and uh it's kind of refreshing to get back into and delve back into the the world of seaweed um and uh hopefully i'll have a few converts tonight uh, let's see why there we go so um Just quickly stephen um somebody yep. mentioned too that uh if the questions could also be put in the chat so we could sure yeah do yeah, that too and then also take some out loud at the end yeah, that, that'll work. Um, so uh, just to frame uh, human relationship with seaweeds, uh, I've got some information here uh, that I, I've found pretty interesting. Um, and uh, some, some of this is a little on the new side. Um, so there is a relatively new hypothesis called the kelp highway hypothesis, which um, kind of goes against the, the land bridge uh, theory of how uh, peoples migrated from Asia to North America. Uh, the Clovis point, as it's called, you, when uh, Asian peoples migrated using land bridges about 14,000 years ago uh, and uh, moved from Asia into Central North America, uh, that was the predominant uh, idea. But what their uh, recent uh, discoveries in Chile and along the western coast of uh, South and South and North Americas have found evidence that um, peoples were here earlier than uh, the Clovis point theory and uh, they are the assumption of the hypothesis is that these people didn't follow an inland route but they followed the the shore and took advantage of uh, the almost continuous abundant resources of the kelp forest that stretched at the time uh, from Asia down the West Coast and into uh, Central America, Central and South America. Um, and uh, the earliest evidence uh, uh, supporting this and of people using seaweeds and food was found in Chile and dates back almost 12 and a half thousand years ago. Um, so for people to have moved moved in that direction and to also uh, find those uh, that evidence of seaweeds being used in in middens and uh, in a medicinal uh, medicine uh, building uh, was pretty impressive. Um, it, it's no, you know, it, it's no surprise to most people that most cultural coastal cultures throughout the world and throughout history have utilized seaweed in some ways. Typically they're used to feed livestock because it's a, it's a cheap and easy fodder um, and readily available when you live on the shorelines. Uh, this practice is still in use today, especially uh, in Northern Europe uh, where uh, herders of goats and sheep and cattle will drive their livestock out onto flats at low tide and allow the livestock to graze on the seaweeds that are exposed. Um, 
But seaweeds were also used in medicine and uh, directly as food for thousands of years. Um, indigenous peoples in North and South America, as I as, uh, said above, uh, use seaweed not only as medicine, but also food and fertilizer. And many of those peoples uh, still hold to those traditions today. Um, really, when you think of seaweed um, and, and cultures, people typically think of the Asian cultures and specifically the Japanese. You know, most of the focus for seaweeds in uh, in North, in American culture is with nori and and its use in uh, sushi, uh, but it uh, it's much more than just some seaweed wrapped around uh, rice and and uh, fish or shellfish. Um, kelp was considered such a critical part of the Japanese diet that as early as 701 AD, legislation was passed that allowed people to pay the emperor's taxes with kelp. So it was so valuable, it was considered uh, a replacement for money uh, back at that time. Um, even though Japan is considered and, uh, and Asian countries are some of the uh, most productive in seaweed aquaculture today, uh, really kelp farming uh, as an organized uh, industry didn't really begin until the mid 1700s in Japan and simply consisted of farmers placing uh, bamboo branches in coastal bays and allowing seaweed to set and grow on them and then pulling those branches out and harvesting the seaweed. Um, even in colonial America, our roots, uh, seaweed was, was an important part of, uh, of colonial life. Uh, and this is illustrated in the state constitution of Rhode Island where it states the people shall continue to enjoy and freely exercise all the rights and fisheries and the privileges of the shore, including but not limited to fishing from the shore, the gathering of seaweed and other activities. And that's in uh, the first article 17 section of the state constitution. Um, to this day, uh, access uh, shoreline access fights in Rhode Island because most of the, the land is uh, along the shorelines of Rhode Island is privately owned. Um, they refer to this and also, uh, so further laws were set where uh, every citizen of Rhode Island was entitled to an ox cart width of shoreline for seaweed harvest. So that meant that no matter who owned the land adjacent to the shoreline, you were allowed to go down there and collect your short, your uh, ox cart uh, load full of seaweed to haul back and use at your your homestead, your your farm, or to feed your livestock. So, um, so those that you know the the use of seaweed is still evident today in in our laws as well as starting to come back in our culture. So, so seaweed aquaculture. Um, while it was practiced in the mid 1700s in Japan, it is a very new industry in the United States. Um, commercial wild harvest of seaweeds has been a small cottage ind industry, uh, primarily in Maine and some areas of the, the West Coast, particularly the Northwest, uh, for several decades. So this consists of people going out on the shoreline uh, and harvesting seaweeds that are considered edible uh, from uh, the shore at low tide, bringing them back and either processing them, eating them directly um, or dry, laying them out in the sun, drying them out, and then uh, you know preserving them in that method for use later on. Um, seaweed as a, a seaweed aquaculture, seaweed farming as, a, as an industry only began in the US in 2009 when Atlantic Sea Farms, formerly uh, ocean approved, was established as the first seaweed farm in Maine. Um, on, on the East Coast and the Northeast, Maine is really the powerhouse of the seaweed uh, aquaculture in, uh, industry. Uh, it's really the other states, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Connecticut, and then finally us. Uh, we are very far behind where, where um, Maine is. Um, and uh, that, that's definitely evident in the, uh, the development of the industry in that state. Um, on the West Coast, really Alaska uh, is the the central key to uh, and and the most uh, prominent state with seaweed aquaculture. There's been a lot. There's a lot of ongoing work. Um, they're developing a mega seaweed farm currently uh, with input from uh, Char Dr. Charlie Arish from Yukon uh, 
currently. Uh, and but even in Alaska, the first commercial harvest was only as recently as 2017. So again, we can see it's a really young industry in in the United States. And most of that is seaweed is really not part of our culture. So the, the importance there ha has really, it's been on the back burner compared to traditional terrestrial agriculture and um, animal uh, fisheries. Uh, so New York, as I stated, is kind of, we've been lagging behind all of our neighbors in the Northeast. Um, the recently passed kelp bill was uh, signed into law this past late this past fall. Um, and what that allows is New York State uh, Department of Environment, Environmental Conservation to uh, amend the conservation law as it pertains to uh, aquaculture in general. Currently, it the, the law only um, references shellfish aquaculture, uh, but the amendments would include uh, kelp aquaculture as well. And this is primarily uh, going to affect the growing of kelp in the Peconic uh, Estuary and Gardner's Bays. Uh, the reason that this had to come about is that um, New York State and Suffolk County uh, had have an agreement where uh, the state ceded the management of the uh, of underwater lands in the Baconics and Gardner's Bay to management by Suffolk County, which is now part of Suffolk County Aquaculture Lease Program. Uh, in that agreement uh, between the state and the county, it only allows for shellfish aquaculture on those grounds. So to allow for any additional species, the not only the conservation law has to be amended, but then the agreement between the state and the county has to be amended. There's one short-sightedness, short-sighted piece to this kelp bill. In the bill, it specifically states that only species within the Laminariales, which is basically the group of kelp, can be grown. So that leaves out any other local species that have commercial, commercially exploitable potential. Uh, and currently, we only have two species of kelp that are commercially exploitable. Uh, there's a third, but it, it's, it has no commercial value. So uh, this whole process may have to happen again in the near future if aquaculture expands into other species or there's an, a, a push for that to happen. Um, one of the things that's it's really surprising um, being that there's less than 100 seaweed farms in the country, uh, and th this even surprised me, uh, is that we're really not limited by the production we're limited by the demand. So the these few farms for such a large uh, populous nation can produce much more than they can actually sell or sell at a profit. Um, so uh, we really need to build the demand side of the industry so that it can keep up with the production side. So um, in a call recently, Atlantic Sea Farms uh, CEO estimated that uh, their 24 partners um, will harvest about 2 million pounds of kelp just in Maine this year. Uh, I believe Alaska is looking at several hundred thousand pounds. So you're, you're talking uh, a considerable amount in very few uh, aquaculture uh, uh, companies and, and ventures. And the problem is, where does all of this product go. And uh, that's something that needs to be addressed in New York and is being addressed by different groups to try to stimulate that uh, demand and increase the market. Um, and again, just to emphasize with aquaculture, one acre of aqua, uh, one acre aquaculture lease has the potential to produce 10 to 30 tons of fresh kelp. So, uh, you know, we're, we're talking a quite considerable amount of production in small areas. So there's definitely an appeal for, for uh, pursuing seaweed aquaculture. So some people uh, ask me, you know, why all of a sudden is this, you know, seaweeds have been around, uh, Asian countries and cultures have eaten seaweeds, even some European cultures have eaten seaweeds. Why all of a sudden is there this big push? Well, in the last few decades, uh, scientists, sociologists have all been looking at uh, human population growth 
climate change and, and other factors and producing these models that basically have found that it's pretty alarming that terrestrial agriculture does not look to be able to meet the demands of, of the global population by as early as 2050. And most of that uh, limitation is due to uh, climate change issues, loss of arable land um, due to droughts, uh, erratic weather patterns, uh, and, and just the we're pretty much to the limit of, of land that's available to, to farm. So the only option we have is to turn to the ocean. And we have a lot of ocean. So, uh, you know, the United States has the second longest coastline in the world of any country. So we have a lot of potential here. Uh, and relatively speaking, out of most countries, our waters, coastal waters are pretty clean and well regulated. Um, yes, we have nitrogen issues, but that's, that's not a human health issue necessarily as far as creating product, it actually might benefit us with seaweed aquaculture. Um, but it is still a problem. Uh, so seaweed aquaculture is, uh, is basically considered a zero, zero input uh, industry. So there's no need to add water. The, your product grows submerged. Within that, submer within that water column that it's growing, there's already fertilizers. Um, and you, there's no need for pesticides. Uh, you know, seaweeds don't really deal with with conventional pests as we would think it. Um, and even when there are issues that could degrade product quality, there's easy ways to go about uh, reducing the impacts. Uh, and really, if you think about it, the cost per acre of uh, getting an aquaculture lease and uh, setting up a pro uh, a venture. In, in seaweed aquaculture is going to be much less uh, for cost than it is in terrestrial, not only in the cost for the, the lease of the land and or space, but also in the equipment that's needed. Um, there's an, another real attractive aspect to this for uh, aquaculture, potential aquaculturists, uh, either seaweed, potential seaweed farmers or for shellfish farmers is that this, this has the potential to provide an additional revenue stream for these people during what's considered a pretty much slow or dormant time of year for them uh, during the winter. So kelp is a, is a cold water species and, and we grow kelp from basically December through May. Um, and these are times when the demand for shellfish are, are low and most of these shellfish uh, oyster growers especially have their, their product on the bottom and uh, just basically overwintering. Uh, fresh kelp sells for anywhere from 40 cents to a dollar per pound with uh, about a 10, put, 10 pound per foot average on long lines. Um, and that's from our general region, Connecticut, New York. Um, dried kelp, which requires some more processing, uh, sells for more due to that processing, but it's also shelf stable. Uh, and that could go for as much as $25 per pound. So there's really a, a revenue stream here that has not been tapped and could benefit growers. Um, the other thing that makes seaweed aquaculture uh, attractive is that it provides ecosystem services, which uh, down the road, things like uh, nutrient bioextraction and carbon bioextraction could provide additional revenue if uh, laws are changed and, and uh, there's funding found to, uh, uh, to mitigate these, these impacts to the environment and uh, pay the farmers to grow them. So. So what is kelp? So these, these are two of our three kelp species that are found in our region. Uh, on the, the left is sugar kelp. Uh, this is the, when I'm talking about kelp today, this is primarily the species I'm going to be speaking of. Uh, and then on the right here is horsetail kelp. Um, sugar kelp is primarily uh, a food. This is the, the culinary species. Um, it's thinner, more tender, has a higher sugar content. Uh, horsetail kelp grows in really exposed, wavy, rough areas along the coastline, so it's it's pretty tough and leathery. Um, so not as palatable uh, texture-wise, uh, lower in sugar, but uh, is very good for uh, fertilizers and and uh, even for food for livestock. Um, both of these species can grow 
upwards of 10 feet or more. Uh, the largest sugar kelp I've seen is about 15 feet long and about a foot wide. Um, so they're, they're considerable. Uh, when you hear the term kelp forest, that we do not have those in the Northeast. Our kelp does not create forests because our kelp doesn't stand upright in the water column like the giant kelp on the West Coast. Um, as you can see on these pictures, there's no little air bladders or to buoy these plants up. They're actually, if there's no current making them flutter in the current, they lay over on the bottom. Um, and I may have a few pictures in ba as backgrounds that you can see that. So these, these plants are neutral to negative buoyant. Um, they sit on the bottom, they have to attach to a hard substrate. Um, and so we don't have a lot of hard substrate on the east end of Long Island. We have a lot of sand intermixed with boulders. Um, so we don't tend to see these large, dense areas that would even be constituted as a bed. However, we do have areas that do have large populations of kelp that we would consider, um, you know, are anal uh, uh, analogous to, to our version of a kelp forest. Um, Long Island is the southern geographic limit at which kelp grows any further south and it's too warm. And we may not have kelp growing here very much longer, um, depending on how water temperatures continue to increase and how fast. Um, we may see kelp basically move north and, and out of Long Island waters. Um, and then just the, there are 30 species of kelps worldwide. Uh, and again, we have three here in New York. Um, so this is primarily the products that we're talking about. Um, is sugar kelp. However, there are other species. I'm going to go through these pretty quickly. Um, none of these are grown commercially in New York yet, um, but I'm sure that they will be. I know Stony Brook is working with Grossalaria, but you have the red seaweed Grossalaria. Um, you have the rockweed, uh, rockweeds or fucus. Um, you have sea lettuce, very ubiquitous in areas with high nitrogen levels, so uh, high potential for bio extraction but it also is a food source uh, in indigenous uh, peoples as well as uh, other cultures around the world. Uh, we have sargasso weed or sargassum. That's another one of the rock weeds. Uh, both these uh, species, the uh, fucus and the sargasso uh, produce alginate like uh, kelp does. So there's a potential chemical component. They're not primarily eaten, but they also are used as uh, iodine supplements. Uh, one of the most fam famous seaweeds besides kelp would be Irish moss, and that's because whenever you have someone tell you, oh, there's seaweed and ice cream, this is that seaweed that they're talking about. Uh, not specifically the seaweed, but the carrageenan that's extracted from the seaweed. Um, so Irish moss, uh, grown commercially primarily in uh, Canada uh, in, on the East Coast for carrageenan uh, production. And then uh, other species in the Pacific are also uh, big carrageenan uh, producers. And then this is my favorite species to eat. Uh, this is dulse. This is another red seaweed that we have locally. It's not super abundant. Uh, I saw more of it in New England when I was in, uh, going to school. Uh, this is uh, sort of like a red version of kelp. It doesn't get as long, probably only a couple feet, has the same kind of leathery texture. Um, is typically dried and uh, eaten that way, uh, sort of like the nori snacks you get at Costco, or uh, one of the ways that uh, my professor in college taught taught uh, the recipe to us is to take the dried uh, dulse you buy at the health food store, put a little uh, vegetable or olive oil in a pan and you fry it up and it actually kind of tastes like bacon. Um, with a bit of an ocean taste to it, but it's not unpleasant. Um, so Lily of Vegan's best bet for something analogous to a BLT. So I'm going to move on now. Uh, and I'm going to go through this process pretty quickly. But this is the bread and butter, the basics of, and the really the backbone of kelp farming uh, on Long Island. And that's producing seed spools. Without these seed spools, there's really no way of actively farming the kelp um, besides going out and wild harvesting by diving or snorkeling or picking it off the shoreline when it comes in during storms. So uh, to be able to put the kelp on a line, have it fixed in place and easily harvestable 
is the key. And this is the, pr the process that uh, is really the most work in growing kelp. Um, we start out in early fall, um, September, October, as the days are getting shorter and the water's cooling, that stimulates kelp to be productive. The reproductive section is called saurus, and it's this dark strip down the middle. And this is what we look for when we're scouting kelp populations to see if it's ready to harvest, to strip the spores out of, to create our seed spools. Typically that happens late, uh, mid to late October, but uh, with climate change, this is, seems like it's being pushed later and later uh, into early November. And that really shortens our period of time that we have to grow our spools and deploy them before the really harsh parts of winter hit. Um, so uh, I'll talk about some of the, the uh, potential projects down the road to help us uh, combat uh, and be more control of the process. So this here is what the saurus actually looks like. It's raised segment of tissue, much darker than the non-reproductive section. Um, so we bring it back to the lab, clean it off gently with paper towel, try to get all the the silt and sand and uh, little microscopic organisms off of it. Now, our culturing of the seed spools is not sterile culture, it, but we try to minimize any contaminants from other animals and plants as best we can. Um, so once we've cleaned that, we cut the section out, we get a section of saurus, it's cut into about one by two inch sections. Those sections are rinsed uh, in an iodine seawater solution that further kills any little critters and bacteria, uh, but doesn't have any effect on kelp as long as you don't uh, uh, submerge it for too long. Uh, usually 30 seconds to a minute is more than enough and that will kill almost everything on the surface. We rinse that, uh, that iodine solution off so it doesn't impact our process later on. Uh, stack the, the pieces over here on paper towels um, place them in, in Ziploc bags and place them in the fridge overnight at 50 degrees. And we basically let them condition overnight. While they're in the refrigerator, uh, it's cold, dry air. The cold doesn't bother them, but the dry actually starts to dry out the tissue. The, not enough to, to actually uh, negatively impact the kelp, but it's enough to make it more receptive so that when we drop it back into the water, it really absorbs water. And that absorption into the cells actually forces the reproductive cells that hold the spores to uh, get flooded and kind of overpressurized and shoot the spores out into solution for us. So, um, and what we have here, this can take anywhere from a couple minutes once we put the, the source pieces in uh, the beaker of sterilized cold seawater uh, to, I've it had to take up to three and a half hours uh, to get a good spore release. And what we're looking for is to go from this clear water here to this cloudy water here. That's telling us that we have a lot of spores in solution here. Um, we do some calculations and counts under a microscope and determine the concentration of the spores per milliliter. And we determine how much of this fluid here with the spores we need to add to our four uh, inch diameter set tubes. Um, to inoculate at a known concentration on our seed spools here. So there's one millimeter uh, twine that's about 200 feet of it wrapped around this two inch PVC pipe. Um, these are placed in uh, the inoculation tubes overnight and allowed to uh, the spores to set for 24 hours. Those spores are pulled, uh, the spools are pulled out after 24 hours placed in uh, a chilled nursery, we use a water bath. Uh, so this is chilled 50 degree water that uh, this 20 gallon tank is, uh, is uh, sitting in. We have grow lights, uh, they're set on timers, they're set at 12 hour day length. Um, for the first couple of weeks, the, the uh, grow lights are set at a low intensity. Too high of an intensity will actually uh, kill the male and female plants, the gametophytes, which are microscopic. Um, after uh, about two weeks, the male and female gametophytes, which are these little microscopic filaments, the female produces an egg that it holds onto, the males produce sperm, they're attracted to the egg by pheromones and fertilize it, and then they produce what we will eventually be our kelp blades, the macroscopic sporophytes. And after two weeks, this is what these sporophytes look like. Now remember, this is a one millimeter 
nylon line. So you can tell they're pretty small. So this is what we look for on our lines. And basically we uh, culture those, those spools for five to six weeks. We are looking for the sporlings uh, or sporophytes to get about one to two millimeters, and then they're ready to be deployed. Hopefully uh, we can get the deployment out as early in December as possible. And that allows the, the kelp to acclimate and absorb nutrients before they, the waters drop below 40 and uh, everything slows down for the winter. Um, so basically the spools are taken out. The long line is put through the spool. The spools are tied into the bite on the line and then they're basically, the spool is run down the line and it unspools and wraps around the lines. And then they're left basically to, to soak for the winter. Uh, maintenance is minimal. Uh, we're looking at periodic visits um, by the growers, uh, especially after storms, just to make sure that your gear hasn't been damaged, your anchors haven't pulled, you haven't lost buoys, things to that effect. And by late May, uh, possibly earlier, uh, the kelp is ready for harvest. And you can see how 10, 10 pounds per foot can happen pretty easily. Um, and this was uh, kelp that was grown off of uh, in Gardner's Bay for our Peconic Estuary Feasibility Study that uh, the county's water quality protection funds paid for back in 2016, 2017. And then this was a newly pick New York State DEC project um, looking at bio, nutrient bio extraction in Great South Bay in 20, 19, 2020, I believe. Um, so this was, these were just parts of the, uh, so there's another section there. So these lines were hundred feet long um, had to be cut into sections to handle. So after you've harvested kelp, what do you do with it? Um, so processing depends on the markets that it's going to. So for human consumption, uh, the simplest method and most widely used is uh, drying it. And that could be as simple as laying it out in the sun or hanging it in a greenhouse to dry or commercial drying ovens like those used for drying hops could be employed to uh, to dry the kelp. Um, for fresh products, kelp, the kelp needs to be blanched. That's dunked in boiling water and then chilled. Um, and then they can be further processed. That blanching step kills off any surface bacteria and pathogens and, uh, you know, makes, makes the kelp, make sure the kelp is uh, safe for consumption. Unlike shellfish, any pathogens would be external on kelp, whereas shellfish are filter feeders. If they're growing in contaminated waters with uh, E. coli or Vibrio or things that is internalized as they filter. So there's no way of really separating those. Whereas kelp, if you do this blanching process or if it's cooked, it definitely will kill your, your pathogens. Um, ways that uh, kelp can be processed. So Atlantic Sea Farms has a seaweed salad and they ferment uh, some of their products. Some kelp is cut into noodles. Um, the stipes or that little stem looking uh, section uh, can be cut into sections and pickled. Um, and then they're packaged either vacuum sealed or flash frozen, and then they can be shipped out. Um, as for any food, um, food handling regulations uh, apply for fresh seaweeds. And uh, those regulations are being uh, hammered out for New York between ag and markets and uh, I believe New York State Sea Grant is helping with that as well. Um, if used for animal feed, it can be fed to the animals directly uh, in an unprocessed form. Uh, they don't usually have the same issues with pathogens as, as humans do. And uh, this has uh, been a traditional uh, you know, cultural use in, in other countries as well. Um, alternatively, you can dry the kelp, grind it into meal. Uh, it's has high nutritive values and can be mixed in with other foods to make pellets or, or similar. Uh, a lot of the, the kelp grown on Long Island may eventually go towards fertilizer and soil amendments. Uh, in this case, uh, you have two options or kind of three. Uh, you can dry, if you're gonna make uh, packaged fertilizers, you would uh, need to dry the kelp and then grind it to desired coarseness. That could be anywhere from pellets to, uh, to powder. Um, you can make liquid extracts, either kelp teas, or you can actually liquefy the kelp. Um, 
and use that and directly apply it or spray it as a Fuller uh, application. Uh, most people that have used kelp at home add it to their compost piles and mulch it. Um, the nice thing about uh, mulching and composting with kelp is that it has a high soil content. And even when it's dried and ground for use in fertilizers or even with the liquid extracts, it has a high soil content and you can burn plants um, if you use uh, the extract to too high of a uh, concentration or uh, too frequently, you can basically salt your soil. Um, so aging, aging the, uh, the kelp uh, in a composting or mulching situation helps reduce the salt and makes it more viable for, uh, for that constituent. Uh, and then we have chemical constituents of, of kelp are, are widely used in pharmaceuticals, cosmetics, nutraceuticals, um, and even in the textile industry now. So the primary uh, chemical removed from, uh, from uh, kelp and other brown algae is alginate or also known as alginic acid. Um, and that entails a complex uh, digestion co uh, chemical process. And uh, so that's not something that would be uh, able to be done by your local grower working out of his garage. Um, and then kelp use for any nutraceuticals or pharmaceuticals would require further laboratory processing. And because they're being given to people as medicines uh, or food supplements, there would have to be some kind of certifications to their uh, their safety. So um, really the, the regenerative, regenerative or restorative aspect of the industry is the fact that seaweeds are not only zero input, especially a fertilizer, but at the same time, they're removing excess carbon and nitrogen from our coastal waters. So not only are we not adding fertilizer, unlike our terrestrial uh, agriculture, but our plants are using up what's basically being washed into our coastal waters or leached from our septics. Um, kelp can assimilate uh, five times the amount of carbon that uh, terrestrial plants can. Uh, so right there for carbon sequestration and global climate change, we have a pretty good tool in the toolbox to help us combat uh, excess carbon in, in our environments. Uh, regional work uh, suggests that uh, carbon uptakes are potentially as high as a thousand pounds of carbon per acre of kelp grown. Um, the same regional studies also found that uh, kelp can take up to 50 to 100 pounds of nitrogen per acre. Uh, so not inconsiderable considering that uh, there's a lot of acreage around Long Island coastal waters that we potentially could be growing kelp. The basic aquaculture lease size for um, the Peconics and Gardeners Bay is 10 acres. So multiply all of those potentially by 10 and you're seeing considerable um, you know, uh, impact on carbon and uh, nitrogen in our systems. Uh, other species of seaweed have potential for bioextraction as well, particularly in the warm seasons. And the red seaweed grossularia is, uh, has the greatest potential um, and can be grown pretty much from May through uh, October every year. So it has a pretty long season. Um, we've done work in Akabonic Harbor, uh, and the background picture shows uh, members of uh, East Hampton Natural Resources Department and one of my coworkers are uh, clipping small pe uh, weighed pieces of Rossellaria into a weighted frame and it's being placed into Akabonic Harbor and it's harvested uh, on a weekly basis. Uh, most of the bio, like 90% of the biomass is removed, weighed, and uh, there was considerable amount of growth um, found in the Rossellaria. And Crossillaria takes up to about 4% its tissue weight in nitrogen. So uh, similar results were found by Yukon when they grew kelp in the East River. So uh, very, and, and also give us the ability, this is also a, a, a product, a seaweed that can be used as a food source. So you could actually alternate seasons with species, kelp in the winter, Crossillaria in the summer, if you didn't want to, if you just wanted to focus on seaweed. Um, if you throw into the mix carbon credits uh, and nitrogen credits, uh, we could provide funding for 
bio extraction projects by municip municipalities, non-for-profits, as well as supporting seaweed farmers by giving them a subsidy for what they're already doing to sell for food or, or other products. And at the same time, significantly improving uh, Long Island coastal water quality. Uh, that is going to take a, a, a lot of finagling and, and uh, some time to, to figure out, if ever. So, uh, but that's still a potential. So uh, future research that I'm interested in and others are interested in uh, in the industry, uh, figuring out new culture techniques for sugar kelp and applying them in Long Island. Uh, and then also uh, figuring out how to culture other local commercially exploitable species and uh, getting, getting those cultures going and uh, you know, basically fueling, fueling the industry using those. So the right now, the holy grail with uh, sugar kelp is uh, it technically called gametophyte banking, but the the most, uh, the closest terrestrial uh, uh, process would be called seed banking, where you basically take a germplasm, which is a reproductive tissue. Uh, in this case, it would be the male and female microscopic gametophytes. Uh, we culture them in the lab and they can be held in red light, under red light, um, and they stay vegetative. They don't produce eggs and sperm. And you can hold them that way perpetually and they just continue to vegetatively grow. Uh, that allows for a lot of things. We could potentially do trait selections and develop strains and cultivars that have higher sugar content or are more resilient to environmental stresses like uh, increasing water temperatures. Um, it also allows us to uh, uh, produce our seed spools without actually having to harvest from uh, native kelp populations. So we don't have to go out there and cut that reproductive kelp blade off. What we could do is take a little bit of the filamentous bundle of the female plant out of the beaker, a little bit of the, the male plant, put them in a Petri dish together, hit them with white light, and they'll produce an egg, release uh, sperm, and we can actually set on our spools that way. This allows us to reduce our impact to native populations, but also control when we want to actually start our uh, our seed spool production. You know, right now we're under constraints from you know day length and cooling water temperatures. Uh, so this way, we potentially could start as early as late August and have our uh, kelp lines in the water by uh, mid November, and that gives almost another half of a month to a month of our our kelp seed strings to acclimate and uh, start to grow before winter hits. Um, and then again, try to try to work with uh, some of the other locally commercially exploitable species. Um, another thing, um, I'm almost to the end here. So uh, another thing would be uh, looking, and this is, there's interest recently in this, trying to uh, bolster the existing populations of sugar kelp uh, to mitigate for the expected commercial use um, through active restoration. So instead of seeding long lines, uh, where there's consideration for uh, setting kelp spores on rock and gravel. Uh, this is a process called green gravel. It's been used in Scandinavian countries uh, to, to mitigate their seaweed farming there. And we would use that to um, that that gravel would spore set on it and the spore fights growing would be placed back into populations or into new areas to kind of maintain our population um, and and off uh, offset the uh, harvest of of uh, reproductive kelp shoots. Uh, hopefully with gametophyte banking, we'll we'll move away from that. So this won't necessarily be as necessary but um, it's definitely a management tool that uh, could be used uh, to help maintain our populations. Uh, another uh, area of interest is identifying the local kelp populations, and this would help uh, regulatory agencies better manage the resource. Really, we have no idea what the potential kelp population and its locations are in Long Island and New York waters. Um, we have an idea of some areas, but we don't, without knowing how much you actually have, you don't know 
what that population can take as far as harvesting um, for, uh, you know, for uh, supporting commercial industry. Um, so no, having that, uh, information, we could develop things like crop rotations where, okay, you can collect from meadow or pop kelp population one this year, next year, you're going to have to come over to this one, uh, or even just, uh, set limits for, uh, harvest in, in areas to, to mitigate impacts. Um, monitoring these meadows also would identify, could potentially identify, um, you know, how, how these meadows are interacting uh, with other environmental uh, factors such as climate change, uh, over harvesting or other uses. It also could identify, help us identify population traits uh, that may be adaptive to climate change like heat tolerance. Um, and then finally, we're looking at developing new methods to uh, take advantage of the bio extraction potential of all the seaweeds. Uh, my background here is a mobile FLUPSI unit, which is a, uh, typically FLUPSIs are floating upweller systems used for shellfish. Um, this was one that our shellfish uh, program pro uh, built um, as a, a model. And this actually runs, the pump is powered by solar uh, and batteries. So it's totally, uh, you know, carbon neutral. And if you threw uh, seaweeds in here and, uh, you know, uh, circulated water through for nitrogen and carbon removal, you're talking carbon negative. Uh, this type of a unit would be good for places where you couldn't put lines or deploy any kind of gear, say uh, areas with cha that are predominantly channel or too shallow and muddy to support any kind of gear. Um, you could roll this up to a shoreline, run a pipe out um, and circulate the water through. And uh, you would just harvest the biomass as it fills the barrels. So groups that are working on uh, seaweed aquaculture on Long Island, uh, Lazy Point Farm, is, uh, part of the Moore Fam Family Charitable Foundation. I've been working with them for two years uh, and we've been looking at uh, not only kelp culture grow out, but training uh, municipal and private hatcheries how to grow the seed spools. Um, we've been collecting data on site suitability uh, based on the uh, outplantings for growers that we have, collecting environmental data and uh, biological data on the kelp that's grown. Um, and Lazy Point Farms is also supporting uh, uh, research into the kelp processing end and product development. So once our industry gets going, you know where's our product going to go and how's it going to be handled. Uh, Stony Brook University has been conducting in research uh, with uh, grassal area and uh, sugar kelp and looking at impacts of seaweed aquaculture on water quality issues uh, like nitrogen and bio extraction. And they're also looking into uh, combining uh, multi-trophic aquaculture, uh, combining seaweed uh, aquaculture with shellfish to mitigate the effects of ocean acidification on shellfish grown. Uh, colleagues at Adelphi have been providing environmental monitoring and biological analysis of kelp. And then of course, uh, at CCE, we're going to continue to uh, basically follow our charter and support the industry with technical uh, advice and uh, educate uh, growers and uh, the uh, community uh, about the, uh, the benefits and uh, the logistics of, of seaweed aquaculture. So uh, these are some acknowledgements for funders in the past, Lazy Point Farms, Suffolk County Water Quality Protection Restoration Program, uh, New EPIC, uh, New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. Uh, our Ag Department at Cornell has done some work looking at uh, fertilizing fertilizer aspects. And then uh, Dr. Charles Yarish is basically uh, the the godfather of kelp for our, uh, and seaweed aquaculture for, for our region, if not the country. And uh, he's, he's allowed me to ask lots and lots of questions and, and learn a lot of stuff. And he's in, at UConn. So uh, I thank everybody for coming and I will take questions. Okay, thank you for that, Stephen. That was really fascinating. Um, does anybody uh, have any questions? No questions. 
I have a question for you. Um, are there any downsides to farming kelp? Like with the lines, are there ever issues with entanglement or like shading out, um, you know, maybe other things growing below it or? So, okay, so typic, typical seaweed, and especially kelp aquaculture is done in offshore waters uh, typically deeper. The kelp lines are set at about uh, six to 10 feet down, depending on water clarity, um, because kelp typically likes water movement um, and cooler waters. So uh, the idea of shallow water kelp aquaculture was pretty much started by Stony Brook and Mariches. And um, that's the only case in which the kelp long lines would really potentially have an impact on shading the bottom. However, mm -hmm. um, one of the, to get a, an aquaculture lease for shellfish, you have to, um, a, a survey has to be done of the, the property and there can't be any uh, species like eelgrass that could be impacted by shading. Um, so uh, already, if you have an aquaculture lease, that's that that pretty much rules out that you're going to impact anything growing on the bottom because that had you, you wouldn't have had a permit for the lease to begin with okay. um as far as other issues so because these are on long lines um they do have the potential if they're grown in water that's deep enough again where a lot of our growers are water at low tide is like three feet if not less than a couple um they, you know, you wouldn't get boats through there in most cases, mm -hmm. but in deeper waters, you do have to be concerned about boating traffic. Um, just like aquaculture, shellfish aquaculture leases, um, the Coast Guard is involved in the leasing, in the permitting process. And I would assume offshore in navigable waters, they're going to require some kind of markers. Um, and in most cases, again, the, the lines are going to be at least six feet deep. Mm -hmm. That, in, except for all the largest boats or sailboats, that shouldn't be an entanglement issue. Uh, I do know that in Connecticut, um, being that we haven't had this process, uh, the permitting process gone through in New York, except for one individual, but again, shallow water and riches, um, the Connecticut growers have to deal with uh, NOAA and uh, National uh, Fish and Wildlife regarding entanglement issues with uh, marine mammals. Mm -hmm. So there are some stipulations for that. Um, it really is minimal. It's it's one single line. Um, it's not a lot of things hanging. The kelp itself is not a, really an entanglement issue. It's not that strong to, to hold a large animal. But Okay. Um, so we'll take the questions that we have in the chat. Uh, Loretta asked, what are the nutrients in seaweed? So there's a lot of them. Uh, kelp has, uh, the one drawback to kelp is that it's very, very high in iodine. So uh, I believe a one ounce serving of uh, dried kelp, which doesn't sound like a lot, but one ounce uh, kelp is 90% water. So when you, uh, you dry it down, uh, it becomes quite a lot um, to equal a pound. Um, a, a, I forget it's 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 a ridiculous it's at least five or ten times the amount of iodine you need so they their recommendations are you don't eat a lot like you wouldn't live off of kelp you'd poison yourself with iodine um there are a lot of trace minerals um again nitrogen is about three to four percent phosphorus uh potassium there's a lot of calcium in kelp uh, a lot of micronutrients um, and metals. That's the one thing with seaweeds too, is that they really need to, the water that they're grown in needs to be uh, tested and clean because seaweeds cannot regulate the uptake of heavy metals and mm -hmm. organic components. So whereas shellfish, that's not as much of a concern. We're more worried about pathogens, seaweeds, that is a definite concern. If you're growing seaweed in, uh, we have uh, a, a so, uh, partner working with us that's growing kelp this year in Newtown Creek in uh, in the city, and that is the one of the most polluted water bodies in the country. Uh, the kelp is growing. I 
can't even begin to imagine what it's going to test for. Um, we were part of a project where they were harvesting uh, sea lettuce out of uh, Jamaica Bay, and they thought they were just going to be able to compost the sea lettuce until they tested it. It had to be taken to uh, an incinerator, uh, a hazardous waste incinerator. It was so bad with heavy metals. So those are things to consider. Um, it does have sugar content. Uh, mannitol is the sugar in kelp um, that makes sugar kelp sweet. Um, you know, you can go online and look a lot of this up. Uh, if you go to Atlantic Sea Farms uh, website, they have their entire ingredients and the FDA nutrient list on all of their products. So uh, it, it varies basically on how you're gonna eat the kelp uh, or, or other seaweeds as far as what kind of amounts and, and what, uh, what constituents they have. Wow, okay. But very, very nutrient dense foods. Um, before we go back to the chat, uh, Christopher has his hand up. So do you want to ask a question? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, this is Christopher. And uh, I thank you for um, mentioning uh, Steve uh, vegans during, during the presentation. I happen to be vegan. And I, I have never tried. Um, I know that it exists. Uh, I haven't gotten a chance to try uh, seaweed bacon uh, yet. And I know that um, uh, I have tried other types like eggplant and I'm just not thrilled with it. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, yeah, and I'm just curious to know, like, um, uh, what can we do to support? Um, I mean, at, uh, I know that Oyster Bay in, in particular mm -hmm. has some of the cleanest water uh, around Long Island. And what can we do to support um, it, uh, business growth um, in uh, buying seaweed products or kelp products? here in the area because I, I have seaweed salad in my fridge. I really love it, uh, but it's, it's very expensive. And I look I look at where it's produced because I know in places like Japan, yep. uh, there are areas where, you know, there's nuclear fallout, um, uh, nuclear waste being, you know, uh, contaminating the water there. So I would not buy my seaweed from a place like, you know, in certain areas of Japan. So um, yeah, I was and, just wondering what you think about that. Yeah, um, so really, as I said, the the it, production is not our is not our bottleneck. It's going to be getting the demand out. Um, we can supply. It really, really, the uses are as as vast as your imagination. So when we did the feasibility study for the Peconics, we had we supplied kelp that we had raised on our our lines for the project to local businesses. Um, one woman was making bath bombs and soaps. Uh, another one was making uh, dog treats with the kelp. Um, we had uh, we provided it to Greenport Harbor Brewery, and they made a seaweed porter ale uh, in coordination with us. Um, cool. So you know, there's uh, there's a lot of potential here. We need to basically educate. Uh, our communities that this is a good thing and again it's almost like the the farm to table movement we need to and and i know the oyster bay has the the farm to fairway um which is which is interesting but uh it, we we really need to to start promoting that this is the way we need to go and it's not so much a uh you know it's not a punishment because you know, we've we've let things get out of control with our environment and we have to, you know, suck it up and eat our broccoli that we don't like and and suffer. You know, there are really good ways of incorporating this into our diet or into our daily lives. Again, you know, some of the kelp, the alginate is being incorporated into textiles. They're making clothing with it. They're making bandages with it. Um, you know, for mm -hmm. burn victims, there's a lot of uses for the for these products. And, uh, you know, if we have these these industries close to home and you know again if you stay within 200 miles of where something's produced your your carbon footprint is is really reduced so we want to keep it local and we do have the ability to 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 meet the supply end of it we just need the demand to catch up so uh, that's really where the businesses are going to have to come in um, somebody asks, uh, how do you protect kelp from power boats? But I think you mentioned about putting it at a certain depth. Yeah, it's certain depth and the fact that we, we're growing our kelp. The lines don't go out until December, early December, and then they're out before Memorial Day, typically. Um, so really, uh, those are, 
you know, we're, we're kind of avoiding user conflict in that aspect. But uh, again, it's going to come down to regulatory allowing permitting. So they're not going to allow uh, these lines to be placed in areas where they're going to be a, a navigational hazard. Okay. Um, somebody asked about the kelp that you have on your back or the uh, seaweed that you have on your background. Um, I guess what so, type of <laughs> so this this is kelp. This is sugar kelp. Um, oh, okay. So sugar kelp's got a lot of different morphologies. Uh, the the this over here, the green is uh, eelgrass, uh, and then there's some sea lettuce over here. But um, so sugar kelp has a lot of different morphologies. Uh, typically, when it's growing in low flowing seawater areas. Uh, it gets these really ruffled edges and it's got these little bumps. What that helps is to make the kelp move with whatever little current it has because it takes up so much nitrogen that if it was to lay stagnant, it would absorb all of the nitrogen within a couple millimeters of the blade's uh, surface and basically not be able to uh, get any more. So by moving that blade, you're constantly re-stirring that and getting fresh, uh, fresh uh, water to the surface of the blade for it to pull out nutrients from the water column. Um, so in Maine, they they um, market sugar kelp and skinny kelp, they call it. Skinny kelp is sugar kelp. It just doesn't have those wavy edges and it's not as wide, it's more strap-like. Those are typically grown in really high wave, high current areas. Uh, the kelp doesn't need to undulate in the water column. It's getting battered and beaten. It needs to become like a belt. And uh, that's used more for like the kelp noodles and things like that, because it's a little thicker than the, the regular sugar kelp. But yeah, that is sugar kelp behind me. And that one's pretty, pretty big. That's almost 10 inches wide. Wow. It was probably <laughs> eight, eight feet long. That's off of Fisher's Island in Long Island Sound. Um, someone asked, how does the carbon and nitrogen affect humans when we consume the seaweed? Um, so the carbon and nitrogen get incorporated into different uh, chemical constituents. Uh, nitrogen typically is, uh, is used to build proteins and amino acids, and the carbon is, is the backbone for sugars. So a lot of the carbon that uh, kelp takes up is used structurally to make the, the cell walls. Um, but also is used to create the mannitol, which gives sugar kelp its name. So uh, if you ever want to try this, fresh kelp out of the water does not taste sweet. You have to let it dry a little bit. And once you see a little uh, whitish uh, like crust start to develop, that's what uh, that's the mannitol that's coming out and is uh, that'll have that sweet taste to it. So kelp totally fresh out of the water, not so sweet. Let it dry out a little bit. It gets a little sweeter. Um, but yeah, the carbon and nitrogen, it's no different than when we eat lettuce or, you know, meat products. We, we break down those components and we use it for our own uh, metabolism. Um, somebody asked, do you see this becoming a viable possibility for employment for fishermen or baymen who have uh, lost their jobs? Uh, absolutely. Fishing, et cetera. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Actually, uh, the main industry is basically run by lobstermen uh, who are not lobstering in the winter and they switch over to kelp. So, uh, you know, these are people and, and it helps that if you're already in that industry. So if you're going to start from scratch, the numbers I've seen are around $50,000 to start up a kelp farm. Uh, I believe it's about a 10 acre piece and then with equipment. So I'm assuming that would include a small boat. Uh, the gear is usually about five to $6,000. Um, it varying depends on how, you know, big of anchors you need and things. But so if you're, if you're already working on the water, you already have a boat. So there's an expense you don't need. So um, it, it's pretty easy. And, that, and that's why oyster, these, the oyster farmers are interested in this because they've already got the grounds. They already have the, the, the basic equipment and they know how to work the, you know, the water for them. It's not too much of a stretch to go from growing oysters to growing seaweeds. Um, so definitely a transferable uh, skill set. And uh, I, I would think if there's, if they're interested in doing it, I don't see why any of these, uh, these people that are, have lost their livelihood due to our collapsing local coastal fisheries can move into this. Again, it's going to take a few years for our industry to get up to speed. Um, I, we're like six years behind Connecticut 
they have about a dozen farms. Um, you know, as I said, Ocean uh, Atlantic Sea Farms has got 24 farmers that they work with, um, and in Maine, and that's not the only operation up there. So we're 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 still baby steps. Um, so it's not something I would, you know, quit my job on Wall Street and <laughs> and start working on my my uh, business plan for my kelp farm yet. Um, so we have a question, would natural sets of kelp be a possibility to offset dependence on aquaculture operations going forward? And uh, this is, I guess, says previous question was thinking in terms of sequestering environmental carbon. Um, <clears throat> if we could determine that we're getting net increase in biomass in natural populations, yes. Uh, the likelihood that we're seeing increases, um, which means we're getting the sequestration. Um, and uh, the natural sets would have to be harvested. If you leave the kelp in the water to uh, degrade, that carbon goes right back into circulation. So um, we need to, so basically the same idea with taking carbon out of the atmosphere, putting it in the trunk of a tree as, as wood, you know, that wood holds it and sequesters it for a long period of time. Kelp breaks down very quickly once it starts to degrade in the environment. So uh, the sequestration aspect of, of, of kelp requires us removing it from the system after it's removed the carbon and, and assimilated it. So, and the fact that natural populations, even if we were to allow the natural populations to grow, harvest them at the end of the season before they die off, with global climate change, we're seeing a lot of these natural populations in our area. So Southern Connecticut, New York, Rhode Island, we're seeing considerable losses in population. So I, I think that would be a losing cause and we might have basically speed up our, our loss of our kelp in our areas. Um, I was also kind of curious to uh, I remember hearing about out in the Shinnecock Bay, they were basically growing kelp and then um, using it as fertilizer or selling selling it as fertilizer, I guess. And then, um, so if you use the kelp as fertilizer, does that then put nitrogen back into the bay and then you use kelp to absorb it again? Or um, So, it, yeah. That's a, it's a tricky question. So kelp has a much lower percentage of nitrogen than chemical fertilizers. Okay. So a lot of chemical fertilizers never get assimilated by the plants that they're intended for. They get either uh, driven down into the groundwater and then eventually make their way into our coastal waters, or they get washed off in rain, rain events and into our local waters. Um, the fact that you're starting with lower uh, nitrogen levels and the fact that you're basically any nitrogen that isn't uptaken by the target plants, the fact that the next season you're growing kelp again and removing that, you know, most if not a, a net, your net removal of nitrogen would be potentially greater uh, than, than what you were putting on land. So, uh, you know, I mentioned the ox cart width of seaweeds in Rhode Island. Seaweed uh, harvesting for fertilizer was a big deal in colonial America, especially in the Great South Bay. Uh, people really, and not only uh, seaweeds, but uh, even seagrass, eelgrass. So for those of you who live in Great South Bay or have been down there in the summertime, you get these massive racks of eelgrass blades that wash in. That wasn't considered a nuisance back in colonial times. That was a resource. Uh, and, and it was only the advent of chemical fertilizers, which were cheaper and easier to deal with. And they proved to be more effective because they were much higher in nitrogen content um, that really the dependence on seaweed went to the, the buy. And, and also the fact that most agriculture became large scale versus everyone had their own small plots. Um, so uh, there's still uh, some organic farms out on the East End on North and South Forks that go out and have access to the shorelines in front of friends' homes and after storms will pull rack out and, uh, and throw it in their composts. Um, and they swear by it. Um, 
the work done by our ag department found that you know the nitrogen aspects are pretty low they think it might be the biostimulants that uh, are found in in uh, in kelp and the calcium are are really the biggest benefits and probably some of the other trace metals um so you know it, it's not miracle grow you mm -hmm. if you if you're gonna if you're gonna fertilize with kelp realize that you're not going to see the same results as miracle grow because there's like 10 times the amount of, of nitrogen in miracle grow right. um but you're also dealing with at least a, a nitrogen balance if you use it or even a net re, uh, nitrogen removal so kind of like a closed loop system <laughs> yeah yeah and and we have so much nitrogen on our groundwater that we're gonna have issues with leaching into into our coastal base for at least 100 years so uh you know, if we can start throttling that back and, and septic and all that fun stuff, we we may actually be able to get a handle on it. Great. I'll tell you, all the sea lettuce is is really a nitrogen sponge. Um, and, and you can tell because pretty much any polluted body of water you go to, you always see sea lettuce. Um, and some of it gets pretty, pretty thick. Uh, I know Hempstead Bay, we've come across it where it's like a foot thick on the bottom. Um, so, uh, and that's all response to nitrogen. Great. Um, let's see. I don't see any other questions coming in. Just want to make sure. Um, also just wanted to mention too, that friends of the Bay did deploy a couple of our own oh, yeah, I forgot. <laughs> um, in December and we're going to be, you know, uh, taking in from collecting data on the growth condition of the kelp and doing water quality monitoring. Um, so to kind of see how it does out in Oyster Bay. Yep. And uh, it's, and the town of Oyster Bay um, has really seemed to, to grab hold of this idea. Uh, and uh, you know, they've reached out to myself, um, Aaron Freeman from Adelphi University and Mike Dole from Stony Brook to uh, advise them on their fairway, their farm to fairway uh, initiative. Um, growing the kelp is not the hard part. It's making <laughs> the kelp usable afterwards. Um, so, well, I shouldn't say that because some we're, we're having some issues in, in some of our growers because of ice this year. Um, and uh, unfortunately that's, you know, when you deal with mother nature, there's certain things you have to, you know, just accept, but uh, she, she's always tougher than we are, but uh, especially in our shallow water growth, that's another, another thing, the offshore uh, growing of, of kelp usually doesn't have issues with ice ever, uh, more storms and, and big boat traffic potentially, but. Okay. Also just wanted to give a shout out to the Lazy Point Farms. <laughs> yep or um yeah partnering in that process um yes i see wendy on yeah Hi, wendy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah they've been, they've been a great partner uh real supportive and you know so enthusiastic about it uh about getting all of this going um you know it's it's been a lot of fun getting back into into the seaweed realm and working with them so uh you know, and, and everybody that's involved in our projects are, are just really, you know, good and they're invested in it. And, uh, you know, we, we're, we're seeing, we're, we're making strides. So um, again, we're still in the early stages. Um, you know, the legislation is new on the books. Uh, we've only had one commercial farmer go through the process, um, you know, oh. and, uh, <laughs> Well, someone had to be the first, yeah. <laughs> uh, and I, it was as much of a learning process, I'm sure, for DEC as and Army Corps as it was for the the uh, the person going for the permit, the farmer. Um, so uh, it's always that's always tough, but um, and, and there's a lot. Again, there's a lot that's not known. So you know, personnel at, at DEC that are dealing with this are not necessarily seaweed people; they're shellfish people. So there's a lot that they don't know in their basic knowledge that they're learning. So, and I've, I've had good conversations with Wade Carden. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, uh, a, it's a work in progress and, you know, things don't necessarily happen overnight. Um, and nor should they sometimes, you know, it, you need to be, 
you need to work through systems. But I'm a, I'm thinking in another two years we'll start to see a, an increase in the number of commercial uh, operations permitted, um, and especially once the, the Peconics, the the county and the state work out the the contracting and the the legality of uh, kelp farming in in the Peconic estuary, uh, you'll you'll really start to see because I've got I've I've fielded a lot of calls from people who have leases and are interested and want to know what the steps are so great <laughs> i know i definitely look forward to um kelp pickles and stuff like that i'm a big pickle <laughs> kelp chips <laughs> you know i what i haven't tried um fermenting fermented kelp products are supposed to be really good uh atlantic sea farms a friend of mine ordered their uh seaweed salad which is a fermented seaweed salad and uh they swear that it's the best seaweed salad they've ever had. I have no, just, just as a disclaimer, I have no financial interests in Atlantic Sea Farms. <laughs> it just so happens that they're the largest, uh, you know, uh, seaweed aquaculture uh, company on the East Coast. So, um, and, and they, they do really good marketing. So, um, but uh, there was, Hal had a question about where would you develop an aquaculture uh operation to support our local area are you talking about uh a processing facility or are you talking about actually setting up a farm uh pro a, uh, a culturing center for the uh, earlier stages to get the schools you know uh so uh cur currently uh east hampton town uh shellfish hatchery islip town shellfish hatchery hempstead town shellfish hatcheries all are able to culture and produce seed spools. Um, Islip and Hempstead have worked with us for the last two years. Uh, Hart Lobster in Sayville is the only commercial uh, uh, spool production facility at this time. Um, so uh, do, you do, do you have a town shellfish hatchery for Oyster Bay? What we uh, used to have Frank M. Flower and Sons. Oh, okay. The um, and, set established, you know, perfect for this type of operation. Uh, absolutely. And, and now they're going out of business, right? Are they closing? Uh, I, no? I can't speak for them. Oh, I okay. <laughs> I, I, I heard, so I thought someone told me that they were ceasing operations, but I, I was kind of surprised by that. Um, I, I'm not in the real, really up to date on the shellfish realm. That's a coworker of mine. But um, yeah, you would you would need some kind of facility, and so for the town of Oyster Bay, they potentially could work with uh, one of the municipal hatcheries. Uh, most of the municipal hatcheries are not able to sell commercially because they're funded by public monies. So they can uh, sell to not for profits uh, or supply not for profits. They can supply their own projects um, or, or other municipalities. So Cornell has that that. Um, set up in with our shellfish hatcheries we supply the east end towns with seed uh shellfish um but we cannot sell to commercial entities uh we can't compete with other commercial hatcheries um but we can support our own projects and other municipalities and government so that would be one way or you find someone to set up you know like you said flowers potentially if they wanted to take that on um it's out of their uh their spawning season uh you know by by october their they should be their uh hatchery should be pretty much shut down uh if it follows suit of all the other ones uh and you could run your like i said we start end of october and five to six weeks you could be done with your seed spools and deployed by you know mid mid december um but it, it's not something that's really uh that equipment intensive um and i should say that all of this and i'll put it in the the ocean approved manual is the so uh the ocean approved seaweed aquaculture manual uh is open source on on the net and uh yukon also has a seaweed um propagation manual that's open source as well so uh, if you look those up 
they'll run you through the Yukon. Uh, Ocean Approve is primarily kelp, and uh, the Yukon covers kelp, chondrus, uh, Irish moss, uh, dulse, and maybe um, nori. I don't remember what the other one was. But it has a few species. And then there's some others that, that are out there that you can find uh, primarily from, from Europe. Uh, different species, but same grouping. So the life histories and everything are the same. So the techniques would be the same. Um, but if you want to see what it entails, uh, everything's there. They show you how to set it up, what equipment you need. Uh, it's really not that intensive to, to uh, produce the seed spools. Uh, it's just if you're looking to produce a lot of seed spools. Uh, you know, my my 20 gallon tank uh, or 10 gallon tank, sorry, uh, will hold 10 seed spools. Um, so uh, if you, and that's, you figure 200 feet for each spool. So there's 2000 feet. So that's about what Oyster Bay, I guess, put out this year, the town. I, from what I was told about 2000 feet of line. Um, um we just have uh, a, I just want to say thank you <clears throat> thank you uh, very nice presentation and uh, any way the group this group can support your research I'm sure <laughs> we'll uh, connect oh, I've been I've, I've been talking with Heather so uh, she knows how to get in touch with me if anyone has any questions as well uh, you know feel free to contact me that's that's my job so it's a good time of year for it too for me I'm not out in the field right now I'm working on reports and writing grants. So uh, I'm always looking for a, a little diversion. Yeah. Thank you, Christine, too. <laughs> You're I'll mute myself you now. <laughs> um, yeah, we just have a note here uh, about a uh, flower. Um, they shut down their hatchery over two years ago, but is still in business. Their lease is up in 2024. Um, but Oyster Bay has its own shellfish hatchery and is in the process of greatly expanding it. Um, and Oyster Bay is also growing kelp in Hempstead Harbor and in South Oyster Bay. And at Tow Bay, I believe. I was on a call with, uh, with them a couple weeks ago. And so three, I think three open water lines and three uh, marina lines they're working with. So six lines altogether this year, um, or six sites, I should say. Um, I haven't heard anything updates. Uh, we've been out monitoring uh, in January and February now. I have to send Wendy over a, a summary of our February monitoring report. Um, but uh, all of our lines that didn't get impacted by ice are doing well and showing really good growth from, from literally like three weeks ago. So um, significant growth changes. So uh, I'm pretty happy and and March really is where the most growth happens from mid March. So the equinox, once that day hits 12 and 12 uh, day length, they really take off uh, through April and May. The, the amount of growth, the, the majority of the growth is done in, in like two and a half months wow. in that five month process. So really a, a phenomenal plant given, given their growth rates uh, in the group in general. So. Okay, um, so I think I'm going to stop the recording.